we begin the series called Gifts of the Dark Wood, which is our Lenten series today. Gifts of the Dark Wood is the title of a book by Eric Elms, excellent book. And we're following the chapters of that book in this series of Lent, thinking about the dark wood. That phrase comes from Dante's Divine Comedy, written in the 14th century. And in the Divine Comedy, Dante has this line, In the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. In the middle of the road of my life, I awoke in a dark wood. Dante, with that sentence, describes an experience that everyone in this room has had or will have or perhaps is having at this moment. The experience of the dark wood. A place, as we sang earlier at the beginning in the call to worship, a place we would avoid if we could, but we know that we can't. That the dark wood times will come to us. Those times when we feel empty, or we feel alone, or confused, or lost, or uncertain, or grief-stricken, the times of the dark wood we're all too familiar with. And it's not just us. Those of us, we're all normal people, we would say. We're all average, ordinary folk. And we might imagine, if we're not careful, that there are these super-Christians or saints who were immune to such things or are immune to such things, and that's just not true. All those who have gone before us in one way or the other have experienced the dark wood, and all those who come after us, after, after us will also. And some of the great leaders of the faith, some of the great teachers of the faith in the past have called the dark wood by various names. The dark night of the soul is one of those names, or the cloud of unknowing. And we've also called it for a long time the wilderness experiences of life. We call it that because even Jesus himself, before his public ministry, went into the wilderness. In fact, the gospel says he was driven into the wilderness after his baptism by the Spirit, where he was tested for 40 days and 40 nights, alone in the wilderness. And the gospel writer, the gospel of Mark says, and all the wild beasts were there. We know, if we're acquainted with the wilderness, what the names of those wild beasts might be. Emptiness or loneliness, or anger or guilt, or uncertainty. We could name them. It's during the season of Lent that it's appropriate that we take this journey into the dark wood and we find there, of all things, gifts. Because there are gifts to be had in the dark wood. For Jesus, in the wilderness experience, after being tested in that way, after the uncertainty of exactly what his calling would be and wrestling with that, he came out of that wilderness experience clear about his call. And then he went immediately into his public ministry after that time he spent in the dark wood. And so it is for us, there are gifts for us in the dark wood, and we'll be looking at those in this series and today, it is the gift of uncertainty that we consider. Now, we know uncertainty is a gift. We know that certainty about everything would be quite dull and boring. We know uncertainty is a gift because it's what makes a novel inter interesting. You wouldn't read a novel if you were certain about everything that would happen in it. Nor would you go to a movie if you knew everything that would happen in that movie 
It's the uncertainty that makes it interesting. It's the uncertainty that makes our vacations interesting or our relationships interesting. If everyone was completely predictable, would it not be dull? And, and yet we crave certainty, don't we? And when it comes right down to it, especially in the dark wood, we cannot imagine that there is a gift to be had with uncertainty. Because we want to be, we want to be certain. The Apostle Paul, in the text that Aidan read a moment ago, is writing to the church at Corinth, the 13th chapter. And he says, When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Then we'll see face to face. Now we know only in part. Then we shall be known fully. We, we shall know fully even as we have been fully known. Now we see in a mirror dimly. It's that uncertainty that Paul is pointing to. Paul seems to be saying that if we give up childish ways, if we are mature in our faith, then we will be able to embrace this uncertainty that is a fact of life, that we only see in a mirror dimly, and we only know in part. There's something that relates to a maturity of the faith to, in this being able to embrace the uncertainty. But I confess to you that I want certainty, and you do too. When, when you flip a light switch, you want to be certain the light will come on. When you turn on a faucet, you want to be certain the water will come on. It, when I get into my hybrid car and I push the start button, I want immediately the car to come to life and be ready to move. Certainty. We, we have to have that, don't we? But where the problem comes in, where the immaturity of my faith comes through when I am thinking childishly, I want to be certain that my prayers will be answered exactly like I want them to be. I want to be certain that when, when I plan my work and I work my plan, as they say, that things will go exactly as I plan them to be. I want to plan out my life and I want to be certain that the plan will go as I want it to be. It's when I fall into that that I, am, that I have taken back childish ways. And Paul confronts me with this text when he says, and now we see in a mirror dimly. That's just the way it is. Now we know only in part. You might find in your translation of the Bible that where it says in the mirror dimly, you might have a footnote. I know this is true in the New Revised Standard Version. That says something about the Greek word that's translated dimly. It's the root of the word enigma, a mystery, a puzzle, a riddle. It's a little awkward to translate it that way. Now we see in a mirror, in a riddle. Now we see in a mirror, in a mystery, in an enigma. And the image is of a mirror dimly, so it generally gets translated that way. But, but the way Paul writes it, it's driving home the point that, that life is full of mystery, an enigma, and it's a puzzle. But Paul is saying it's not so much a puzzle to be solved or to be worked out, but to be embraced and lived because there is a gift in that uncertainty, even when it's the uncertainty of the dark wood. Sometimes it's very difficult to see because we want, we want, or we believe we want certainty. Let me give you an example, speaking very personally. Some of you may have even heard me say this. Whenever the conversation of health would come up and, and conditions that run in families, I would always say something like this. Well, in my family, it's heart trouble. That's the condition that runs in my family. But in my family, we don't have cancer. No blood relative, grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, 
siblings, not a case of cancer in the whole family. I was, I was certain of that, and foolishly, I sort of put my weight down on that certainty until June of 2015 when my brother was diagnosed. And then came the uncertainty. Then came the dark wood. And I'm still honestly thinking about the gifts that could come from that uncertainty, but I can tell you, I can tell you of one for sure. It's a gift that comes when the Holy Spirit shows up in the dark wood. I love the way that Eric Elms, the author of the book, defines the Holy Spirit or names the Holy Spirit. We said it in our prayer at the beginning of the service. The unexpected love. Isn't that a great name for the Holy Spirit? The unexpected love. The unexpected love that shows up in the wilderness, in the dark wood, in the uncertain times. The unexpected love showed up. I can't speak for my brother who died 13 months after his diagnosis. He can't speak to you today, but, but I know what he experienced in terms of the gift of uncertainty. He lived with uncertainty for all that time, but the unexpected love showed up, and the gift of that was trust a deepening of trust. Because Mike could say, as Paul did, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And that trust sustained him even in the dark wood, and it was mighty dark. The gift of uncertainty among its gifts is the gift of trust. We can't be certain, but we can trust. And the unexpected love shows up with that gift. But we still seem to want certainty, don't we? Brian McLaren has a wonderful line. It's simply this, certainty is overrated, and it is. But we still want it, because what's certain we believe we can trust and we can put our weight down on that and and so we want to make everything that we can certain it's just safer that way we can be certain in the book in the chapter on the gift of uncertainty there is another scripture reading that comes into that chapter it's a story that's found in the fifth chapter of the gospel of john Jesus is walking one day, and he walks by a place called the Pool of uh, Bethsaida, or Bethzatha, or Bethesda. It's known by all those names. Scholars, many scholars, didn't believe for sure that the Pool of Bethsaida even existed, that perhaps it was simply a story that would illustrate the healing power of Jesus. But in the 1960s, I think it was 1967, it was unearthed in an archaeological excavation, and you can see it today. It's a large complex, and it's by the Sheep Gate of the old city of Jerusalem. And it had an interesting superstition that went with it. The idea was that if the waters were troubled, it was a spring-fed pool, sometimes it would bubble, the surface of the water would be troubled or would ripple. And the belief was that an angel or a spirit had touched the water and the first person in the pool would be healed of whatever their infirmity was. And so we read about this in the fifth chapter of John. Jesus is walking by the pool and he sees a man who has been by the pool for 38 years watching the water, 38 years. 38 years. What were you doing, if, you're, if you were alive then, what were you doing 38 years ago? I was sitting in a, it was a Monday, I looked it up. <laughs> I was sitting in a college class probably 38 years ago, or skipping a college class 38 years ago. That's a long time. 38 years he's been sitting and watching the pool for the water to be troubled. And Jesus says to the man, 
Do you want to be healed? What a question. Do you want to be healed? Why would Jesus ask that? I mean, surely he wants to be healed. Why would he be there seven days a week, we can assume, because this is a Sabbath and he's sitting there? He answers Jesus, well, when the water's troubled, I, I can't move, so I can't get down to the water, and there's nobody to help me get down to the water. Someone always beats me into the water. First one in, gets healed. Really? 38 years. 38 years he has lived this very predictable life, certain that the pool will be there, that most of the familiar faces will be there. Undoubtedly, there were people who helped him. He probably made his living as a beggar. People would come and would give to him. He, he probably, after 38 years, he had seniority, probably had the best spot by the pool. Do you want to be made whole? Jesus asked. That's a great question. It's like asking, do you want things to be different? Do you want certainty? Or do you want to be made whole? And sometimes those are very different things. I remember going to the doctor a number of years ago, and the doctor talked about my weight and my cholesterol. And he did it in such a way that he might as well have asked, do you want to be healed? Well, I don't know. I sure like my food. I like my habits. I like things the way they are. I'm certain I like that. I don't know if I like this other thing. I remember going to a counselor a few years ago to deal with stress. The counselor listed all the things. He even said, well, you know what's good for stress. What are some of those things? Well, I had to name them. Exercise and taking time off and meditation, eating right. And the question in that conversation was, okay, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be different? We don't always want to. And, and so in the darkwood time, when, when certainty becomes the most important thing for us, in those times of confusion, in those times when we aren't quite sure the direction of our lives or where things are going, when our way is wholly lost, to use Dante's phrase. If certainty becomes our main thing, certainty can even become sort of like God for us. The most important thing, to know. Not to know in part, but to fully know. To see. Not to see in a mirror dimly, but to really see clearly exactly where life is headed. And there's not the gift of trust in that. Certainty is overrated, Brian McLaren said, and I've seen it, I've seen it. As I've talked to people through the years who are part of a religious tradition where there is certainty, where the most important thing is you know exactly if you do these things, then you will be blessed in this way. And if you are this way, then things will be great. If you pray the right prayers, then you will be blessed and things will go well for you. And that's just fine until you go into the dark wood and that house of cards collapses and falls apart. But the good news, even for those folks is the unexpected love can show up. And if they're paying attention, then they can see in the uncertainty of life is the gift of trust and knowing that God is fully trustworthy. Like Rilke's swan, we can let our weight down in the elemental water that always bears us up. 
because we were created for that water. The gift of uncertainty is the gift of trust. The gift of uncertainty is the gift of being able to trust and to follow as God leads. And so often we discover that path in the dark wood. Let's pray. Oh God, we confess that sometimes certainty is at the top of our list. We want it. We work for it. We believe it's the most important thing. Oh God, help us to see in uncertainty. We learn to rely on you, to trust in you. That we can let all of our weight down because underneath us are the everlasting arms to hold us up. The unexpected love. Amen.